the talk is titled The Shield of the Believer, which comes from a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which we'll look at in a moment, bi'ithnillah. Before that, it's really important to understand that the religion of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is nothing but a continuation of the previous religions of Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa usalli wa usallimu ala man bu'itha rahmatan lil alameen. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man ihtada bihadihi ila yawmiddin amma ba'd. Jazakumullah khairan brothers and sisters for your attendance. It's a pleasure seeing you. And I ask Allah Ta'ala that all of us can go away today with something that we can take away and act upon. And that Allah Ta'ala benefits us with some of what we hear. And as I said to the brothers and sisters yesterday in Glasgow, sometimes when we attend these types of programs, we might hear things that we're already familiar with and hear things that we have perhaps heard before. And at the same time, we'll also hear things that maybe are new to us and we can take away of things that we haven't been exposed to before. But even those things that we have heard before or are aware of previously, uh, subhanAllah, at times, it's after hearing something five times or ten times or twenty times when, when really we take something away and then go away and act upon it. And there's been times where I've learned things and taught things and memorized things. But when I hear it from a certain individual or a certain scholar, it has a sort of impact on me. And only then do I actually start to consistently act upon that piece of advice. Now, this is the uh, introductory lecture. And bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, there'll be many more beneficial uh, discussions to come. And briefly, I'd like to talk about the nature of fasting and the talk is titled the shield of the believer which comes from a hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam which we'll look at in a moment bi'ithnillah before that it's really important to understand that the religion of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is nothing but a continuation of the previous religions of allah meaning the religion of god is one the religion of God is one. The religion of Islam didn't begin 1,400 years ago. And this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Al-Anbiya'u ikhwatu min allat. The Prophets are brothers. Ummahatuhum shatta wa deenuhum wahid. Their mothers are different. Their mothers are many. But their religion is one. Their religion is one. And this is why the religion of Adam and the religion of Musa and the religion of Isa and the religion of Nuh and the religion of Ibrahim is the religion of the Prophet ﷺ. No difference. And this is why Allah commands the Messenger. And a command to the Messenger is also a command to the rest of the believers, as the scholars of Usul Ta'ala have laid out. Allah commands the Messenger to follow the previous Prophets. When Allah Ta'ala spoke about a number of the Prophets of Islam, He said, they are the ones Allah has guided. So follow their guidance, the guidance of the previous prophets. And this is why the religion of Islam, it's not just the shahada, la ilaha illallah, that was the same in the time of Ibrahim and Musa and Isa. Actually, all five pillars of Islam existed before. The shahada, and salah, and zakah, and sawm, and hajj, these five pillars of Islam are not new to the religion of Islam. The religion of Islam meaning the teachings of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Ta'ala tells us about many prophets. Ibrahim is only one example. Ibrahim makes dua and says, Rabbi ja'alni muqeem as-salah wa min dhurriyyati rabbana wa taqabbal dua. Oh my Lord, make me from those who establish the prayer and my children. And my Lord, accept our dua. So Ibrahim was asking Allah to be firm on prayers. And 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the Prophet Ismail, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِسْمَعِيلِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ وَكَانَ رَسُولًا نَبِيًّا وَكَانَ يَأْمُرُ أَهْلَهُ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاةِ وَكَانَ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ مَرْضِيًّا Ismail used to command his family to perform salah and to give zakah. To perform salah and to give zakah. Ismail is who? Ismail is the son of Ibrahim. That means he's from the earlier prophets. And Allah Ta'ala says, and this is the topic of this conference, generally speaking, he says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ Fasting has been prescribed upon you, O believers, as it has been upon those who came before you. And Allah says to Ibrahim, وَأَذِّمْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا And call to the people, call the people towards hajj. Call the people towards hajj. So see how the five pillars of Islam are things that aren't new. And this is really important to have as a background in our minds that when we are fasting, we are following the religion of Allah Ta'ala from the time of Adam to today. When we are performing salah, we are following the religion of the prophets, the path of the prophets. It's not a new religion. It's not a new religion that we're coming up with. Yes, Allah Ta'ala has sent the messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the final messenger. وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ بِالْحَقِّ We have sent down the book to you with truth. مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ Confirming the previous scripture. وَمُهَيْمِنًا عَلَيْهِ And as a criterion, as a, as a dominating book over the other books, yes. So the Qur'an and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do have their distinct qualities and special status. Now, Allah Ta'ala gives us the reason behind why he's made fasting an obligation. He says, as in the verse of Surah Al-Baqarah that I just mentioned, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Fasting was decreed upon you as it was upon those who came before you, so that you may attain taqwa. Taqwa is an incredible term. term. Taqwa is a teaching that all the teachers, all the prophets of Islam have come with. And when we are constantly listening to taqwa being encouraged, but not really appreciating its meaning, it just sort of becomes repetitive. Every Friday we hear the khatib saying, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqu allaha haqqa tuqatih, Ya ayyuhal nasu attaqu rabbakum ul... These are verses about taqwa, but we're just sort of, some of us just wait for the khatib to finish, he's just doing that bit at the start which doesn't mean anything, let's wait for that bit to finish and then we can get to the actual khutbah. No, this is an essential part of the khutbah. He's talking about taqwa. He's talking about one of the great objectives of these acts of worship that we're performing. We're not fasting just so that we can get a quid or two quid or three quid of reward. We're fasting because fasting instills and inculcates into ourselves a feeling of awareness of God. That's what taqwa is. Taqwa is that we are living our lives with an awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why is there such an emphasis on taqwa when it's an internal thing? That's a, potentially a uh, a question that might cross our minds. Why does Islam focus so much on the heart? When the heart, I mean, if you've got a clean heart, if you're sincere, good for you. But how does that benefit other people? Why are we held to account according to what's within us and not according to actual material benefit? That's because without taqwa, we won't have the strength to refrain from things that are wrong. We won't have the strength to refrain from injustice. The oppressive ruler without taqwa will easily oppress. The father or the husband or the uh, leader or a president or whoever it is, without taqwa will, will easily oppress. Taqwa is what keeps us away from things that are wrong. We might wish to do something that displeases Allah, that harms us or that harms others. Taqwa is what prevents us from doing so. That's why the emphasis is on the heart. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى لَا يَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ صُوَرِكُمْ وَلَا إِلَىٰ أَجْسَامِكُمْ Allah doesn't look at your images, your appearances, nor does He look at your bodies. وَإِنَّمَا يَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ وَأَعْمَالِكُمْ But rather He looks at your hearts and your, and your actions. He looks at your hearts and your actions. And this is taken from the Qur'an directly, as is the case with hadith generally speaking. Hadith. The hadith of the Prophet 
isn't detached from the Quran. It's a side point. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ is a continuation of the Quran. It's an explanation of the Quran. As Imam Ahmad rahimahullah says, as sunnatu innama tufassiru Quran. The sunnah is only there to make tafsir of the Quran, to explain the Quran. And this is why some of the scholars of the past said, give me any authentic hadith and I will find you its roots in the Quran. Give me any authentic hadith and I'll find you its roots, its origin in the Quran. So this hadith that I just mentioned comes from the statement of Allah Ta'ala. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ on the day on which no wealth and no offspring shall benefit anyone except the one who comes to Allah with, with a sound heart, a pure heart. And so the objective of fasting is that we keep away from things that are halal. Because food and drink and marital relations are all halal and tayyib. Allah calls them halal and calls them tayyib. And we're rewarded for doing so in the right measure, in the appropriate way. Even though their worldly desires, no one needs to tell us, eat and drink, because we do that anyway. No one needs to tell us, marry and have relations, because that's a natural thing anyway. But it's halal, and Allah explicitly mentions that. And Allah commands us to keep away from that which is halal, so that we are developing and training and disciplining ourselves when we are faced with haram and the potential of falling into haram, we are even more likely to keep away from that then. Because we've just spent a whole month keeping away from halal. And therefore keeping away from the haram becomes, becomes easier. That's the main objective of fasting. That's the main objective of fasting. is so that there is an awareness of God created. I can eat and drink. I can eat and drink easily. I can break my fast without much of a problem. Because nobody's watching me fast. Nobody's watching me fast. It's like wudu. No one can look at someone and say, yeah, he's definitely got wudu. Or look at another person and say, yeah, he's definitely fasting. Or he's definitely, there's no way he's fasting. Unless you're watching the meat, or watching someone break wudu, then you're not going to be able to make that judgment. And so, this is why fasting has its special reward with Allah Ta'ala. And this is why the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, Allah Ta'ala says about fasting, as li. Fasting is for me. Leave fasting to me. Every good deed is multiplied by 10. And multiplied by more than that. Allah multiplies as He wishes. Uh, as I said to the brothers and sisters in Glasgow yesterday, our religion is not mathematics. Allah Ta'ala doesn't require us to count good deeds. To count, oh today I've done this, therefore we've multiplied that by 10, therefore I've got this many good deeds. Oh great. That's not the objective of Allah Ta'ala at all when He teaches us about the great reward of a good deed. The objective is gaining a closeness to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, gaining a sense of taqwa and consciousness and awareness of God. And when that happens, everything we do becomes guided by Allah's guidance. Everything we do. And this is why the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us Allah Ta'ala says, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا افْتَرَفْتُهُ عَلَيْهِ There is nothing that my servant can come closer to me than those things that I have made obligatory upon you. What are the main things that are obligatory upon us as Muslims? The five pillars of Islam. The five pillars of Islam. The one who perfects these five pillars of Islam, is that enough to be successful? Yes, it is. Of course, it's enough to be successful. The Prophet ﷺ told us so. In fact, a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and when he, taught, when he was taught that there are only five daily prayers that you must pray and there is only one month that you must fast and there is one zakah that you give annually and there is one hajj that you must perform in your lifetime. He said, Wallahi la azidu ala hadha wa by Allah, I'm not going to do any more than that. If that's it, alhamdulillah. Do I have to do any more? In another uh, hadith, he says, Hal alayya ghayraha? Is there anything else that I need to do other than these five prayers? Qala la. He said, no. Illa anta tawwa'. Unless you want to volunteer and do good deeds, that's up to you. So he said, Wallahi la azidu ala hadha. By Allah, I'm not going to do any more than that then. The Prophet ﷺ said, Aflaha wallahi in sadaq. 
if he's truthful about what he's saying, then by Allah, he's successful. He's successful. And that's why from the faults of today is to make it seem like it's almost impossible for a person to, to enter Jannah or to be successful or to be from the pious servant of Allah Ta'ala. No doubt, the more a person does, the greater their status. But at the same time, there needs to be a, a feeling of optimism in our community and hope. And, and hope. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put hope in people's hearts. Uh, once a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the hadith is in the Sahihain and said, Ya Rasulullah, met as Sa'a, O Messenger of Allah, when's the day of judgment? He said, What have you prepared for the day of judgment? He said, To be honest, I haven't really prepared much. Except that I love Allah and His Messenger. So the Prophet says, A person shall be with the one who he loves. You love Allah and His Messenger, you'll be with Allah and His Messenger on the Day of Judgment. Putting hope in people's hearts. Not having a guy breaking his back, doing acts of worship, and then someone comes and you know, tells him that he is a failure and he's going to Jahannam and he's this and he's that. Prophet wasn't like that. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, when he heard this incident, he said, فَمَا فَرِحْنَا بِشَيْءٍ فَرَحَنَا بِقَوْلِهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمَ الْمَرْءُ مَعَ مَنْ أَحَدْ There was nothing that we were as happy with. This is Anas ibn Malik. There's nothing that we were as happy with as the statement of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم you shall be with those who you love. And so the person who perfects these five pillars of Islam, bi'ithnillah goes to Jannah. Bi'ithnillah goes to Jannah. And is successful without hesitation. That's not my guarantee, that's the guarantee of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Now, back to the hadith in which Allah Ta'ala says, the most beloved thing that a person can do to come close to me is those things that are compulsory. And my servant shall continue to do good actions, good deeds, and come closer to me by doing those deeds. See, the objective is what? Closeness to God. Not counting. It's not business. The objective is closeness to God. Coming closer to God. And this is why a person could do one action, and it's far greater than the one who does a hundred actions. Because Allah Ta'ala wants quality and sincerity. As in a, another hadith, سَبَقَ دِرْهَمٌ أَوْ سَبَقَ دِنَارٌ مِئَةَ أَلْفِ دِنَارٌ One dinar has beaten a hundred thousand dinar. One dinar has beaten a hundred thousand dinars. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, and the hadith is reported by Nasa'i and others. What does that mean? That means that this one person who didn't have much money himself, but he, you know, did his best to give something. That's, that's the most he could give. And the other person has tons and tons of wealth, and he gave, his, gave a, a large portion of his wealth, maybe 100,000 pounds or whatever. And he gives that, maybe he gives it wanting to give it, maybe he gives it to show off, maybe he gives it for whatever reason. That one pound is greater than that 100,000 pounds. Allah Ta'ala wants quality from us. Allah Ta'ala wants sincerity from us. And this is why sometimes we might be amazed. How in the world can this guy, who does X, Y, Z, many sins, enter Jannah? How can someone enter Jannah for feeding a cat? How can ent someone enter Jannah for doing this, for doing that? How can someone enter Jannah for just saying La ilaha illallah even though he's got scrolls and scrolls of sin and these are all things that the Prophet Sallallahu told us. How can that happen? Because Allah Ta'ala wants quality, sincerity and humility from us. Allah Ta'ala didn't create us to be perfect beings. Allah Ta'ala didn't create us like that. Anyone who thinks that Allah expects perfection from us doesn't understand what Allah Ta'ala wants from us. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that we shall commit sin. In the Sahihain, meaning in Al-Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, كُتِبَ عَلَى آدَمَ حَظَّهُ مِنَ الزِّنَا مُدْرِكٌ ذَلِكَ لَا مَحَالَةً Every son of Adam, every child of Adam, shall have his portion of zina, adultery or fornication written upon them. Whether they like it or not. 
The adultery, then he went on to explain the adultery of the eyes is, is to look with desire, the old adultery of the hand is to touch, the adultery of the ears is to listen, etc., etc. The point is, every person has their portion of sin written upon them. It's there. Now it's our duty and our role. When we fall into that mistake, we know who Allah Ta'ala is. And to run straight back to Allah Ta'ala. Allah. Rush and run to Allah. Run to Allah Ta'ala. Now, to end this hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu told us that Allah says, when my servant continues to do good, to do the best he can, to put an effort into praying additional prayers and fasting and so on, he will continue to do so Hatta kuntu sam'ahu alladhi yasma'u bih I shall become his hearing that he hears with Wa basarahu alladhi yubsiru bih And I shall become his eyes that he sees with And I shall become his foot that he walks with And I shall become his hands that he holds with Wa la in sa'alani la u'tiyannahu Wa in istajabani Wa la in istaadhani la u'idhanna And if he asks me I shall give him, and if he seeks protection from me, I shall grant him. What does it mean that Allah becomes our eyes and our ears and our hands and our feet? It means that every time we speak, or we look, or we hear, or listen, or act, we're doing so with Allah's guidance. Because these acts of worship that we're performing with the intention of gaining closeness to Allah, these acts of worship that are inculcating into us taqwa and awareness of God, they have developed us into people of God, people of Allah, people who behave according to Allah's will, act according to Allah's will, speak according to Allah's will, hear according to Allah's will. These are the, these are the greatest objectives of, of fasting. And so when we are doing the various acts of worship that we do in Ramadan, then we should bear this in mind. We should bear this in mind. We shouldn't turn it into a, a, a challenge of calculating as much good that we can do instead we should turn it into a personal challenge of gaining as much closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us as-siyamu junna fasting is a shield a shield from what? a shield from hardship and punishment in the next life but also a shield in this life how is it a shield? It's a shield because every time we are abstaining from something which is permissible for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and knowing that Allah is observing us, that acts as an extra shield from other desires. It acts as a shield from other desires. As we said at the start, if we abstain from halal, then this fasting develops in us an ability to abstain from haram. And that's why when the Prophet ﷺ encouraged young people to get married, he said, those who aren't able to, what should they do? They should fast. فَإِنَّهُ لَهُ وِجَاءَ Because fasting is a wija, it's a shield, it's a barrier. Fasting is a barrier. This is another example of how the, uh, these ahadith link with the verse of, so that you may obtain taqwa. Fasting grants us taqwa. How is that taqwa? The Prophet ﷺ explains it as, as being a shield. It protects us from evil desires. It protects us from things that are unwanted in this world and protects us from Allah's punishment and enters us into Allah's mercy in the Akhirah. I will suffice with that. May Allah Ta'ala grant us all a witnessing of Ramadan and a successful Ramadan. Jazakumullahu khairan wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.